All right, I'm going to take you back because I want, to make a, I want to make a key point. I was raised by a single mom who had me when she was 16 years old. I grew up in a small town of Woodbury, Tennessee, and I still remember my mom working multiple jobs. She was scrappy. She was hungry. And I remember her working multiple jobs. So I spent a lot of time with grandparents. I spent a lot of time with aunts and uncles. I spent a lot of time with cousins. But one, one particular place I loved going every day was down to the local baseball field. And so at four, five, and six years old, I would go down to the local baseball field and I would literally stay for hours and hours and hours. And at six years old, a female baseball coach named Mickey Vincent watched after me and took after me and fed me and made sure that I had everything I needed while my mom was working these two jobs. And so I had this big revelation at six years old that a good coach can change a person's life. And I want you to really understand this because who is coaching you matters. It's going to set you up for success or failure later in life. It's going to prepare you because I'm coaching adults today that many of them have had bad coaches or poor coaches and they don't have the kind of things I teach. Confidence, bounce back, uh, how to handle rejection, how to show up every day, how to fight through fatigue. Okay, and so at six years old, I'm down at the local baseball field where my baseball coach is, right, your baseball coach. I'm down there at the local baseball field, and man, I'm watching, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm like, man, one of these days, when I grow up, I want to be like that. Now, I want you to think about, we got a lot of young people here, we got a lot of adults here. So at six years old, I have a big revelation. Big revelation is a good coach can change a person's life. You say, well, why is that important? Many years later, I would write this bestseller. Everybody needs a coach in life. You know where that started? When I was six years old. So because of my revelation, big aha moment that everybody needs a good coach in their life, I have conviction. And conviction is a deep-seated belief in your ability to get another person to a better place in their life. So six years old, I have the revelation. Because of the revelation, I now have conviction. Because of the conviction, I'm now ready to take action. I want you to think about that. That's 36 years ago. So from the time I was six years old, I was interested in coaching people. I was interested in motivating people. So at 15 years old, I got a, a call from a local baseball coach who said, I'm going to start coaching junior pro basketball, but I don't know anything about basketball. Will you help me coach this team? And I'm like, man, I, absolutely. I'd love to. Now, what did he see in me that I didn't see in myself? Because many times in life, leadership to me, for all the coaches in the room, is about seeing something in a person and affirming and validating the worth and potential in another person in so clear a way they begin to see it in their own self. Does that make sense? I didn't see myself as a coach, but he saw me as a coach. I was a little a point guard on the basketball team. Y'all, you know, y'all wasn't a post player. Y'all figured that out, right? And I was a little point guard, so I was always thinking and strategizing. And my high school coach called me professor. He's like, man, you're always thinking and you're always, you know, you're always assisting and you're always looking after your teammates. And he said, man, one of these days you're going to be a great coach. And I begin to hear this. I heard it at six years old. So 15 years old, I get a call and he says, I want you to help me coach this junior pro basketball team. I'm like, man, I would love to. I'm in. So I get dressed up in a suit to go coach junior pro basketball. I look like a little Pat Riley coaching junior pro, okay? Uh, so, so I go down there and I'm in a suit and tie. I'm 15, and I'm coaching 9- to 12-year-old kids. And, uh, and, I, and man, the, the second I started doing it, I loved it. I'm like, this is what I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life. This is very important. Parents, what I see a lot from kids today is they have no guidance as it relates to what's going on later in life. So they go down this path. They never think about what they want to be when they grow up. Then they go to college. Then they spend four or five years trying to figure it out. And the next thing you know, if they're 25 or 26 or 27 years old, and they got no direction and no purpose and no success. And it's all because nobody walked into their life and said, look, try this, try this. Okay? So one of the things I did as a successful coach at Riverdale is I linked up my players with successful people in the community. And I had a, a, a career night every year. And a career night was where I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my players say, I want to be a nurse. I want to be a, a coach. I want to be a this. I want to be that. And I said, all right, I'm going to go find somebody in our community that's doing that. And I'm going to bring them in. And for one night, we're going to let you spend time with them asking them questions. I'm going to help you prepare the questions. So it would be a big dinner. So we did career night. Do you know, for all the parents in the room, that after one night of spending the evening with that person doing that, 
many of those people changed their mind about what they wanted to do. Like I had a lot of them say, I wanted to be a nurse. And I said, hey, ask a nurse what it's like on a, on a, on a bad night. And the nurse would say, well, it's like this and this and this. Many of the kids, just through one conversation, changed their mind about what they wanted to do. But they didn't know, but we forced them to have the conversation. So, so 15 years old, I'm coaching, and I'm passionate about coaching, and I'm coaching my team like I'm coaching in the NBA. Like if you ask anybody who went back and watched me coach in those days, I took stats, I, I wanted to film the games, you know, I mean, I was writing my players' notes about how they could do better, and, and as the story would go, I would get so passionate in games, I'd get so worked up, I'd get so excited, I didn't know how to control my enthusiasm. Coach Barrett actually threw me out of a junior pro basketball game. He was a referee. Gave me three technical fouls, and I got ejected. And I got a standing ovation on the way out, okay? Because I didn't know how to control my passion. But now I'm coaching, 15. So at 18 years old, I go back to my small elementary school. So, so let me go back to the parents. Is it ever too early to start your child on a path to what they're going to do later in life? Yes or no? No. I started at 6. 15, I'm coaching. 18, I go back to Woodbury Grammar School, and I walk in, I said, I want to be the head boys basketball coach at this school. What did he say? Because I'm only 18. What did he say? You're too young. I went back 14 straight days. Every day. Okay? It's very important to the story. And he gave me that job. So after the 14 days, like, kid, you got the job mainly because nobody else wants this job. Okay? And so we're going to give you the coaching job. So I built my own office. I coached the team. And in the very first year, we won a state championship. And the principal came to me at the end of the year, and he said, we think you did such a good job coaching this year, we think we would like to pay you. I'm like, oh, this is cool. How much are you going to pay me? $199.50 for the year. I wasn't doing it for the money. What was I doing it for? For the experience. For the experience. Don't forget this. In life, here's a problem with most young people. They want to go after the money versus the mentor. So they come out of college, they say, I'm going to go to a job that pays me the most money. Big mistake. Bless you. That's one of the biggest sneezes I've ever heard too, girl. Here's the deal. What you ought to be, what you ought to be going after is to mentor under somebody who can help set you up for success for the rest of your life. Everybody see that? So at some point I'm going to write a book called Go for the Mentor Over the Money. So at 19 years old, I'm going to college at Middle Tennessee State. We've got any MTSU grads here? Okay, I'm going to college at Middle Tennessee State. Here's what I did. I went to class at 7 a.m. in the morning. You know how I many people there at 7 a.m. in the morning? In, class, in college? Me and my professor. And I got a lot of special attention in that geology class. And I got a D in the class, by the way. But I took my classes at 7, 8, 9, 10, so I'd be done at 11. So at 11 o'clock every day, I'd go coach the team. I'd work at the office. I'd work 10, 12 hours a day. I'm coaching my team. I'm building my craft. I'm learning. And at 19 years old, I get a phone call from the head coach at Riverdale High School. Here's a concept. Every day at your current job is an interview for your next job. Every day in your current role is an interview for your next role. People are watching, judging, critiquing. So how good do you need to be every day? You need to be average, you need to be great every day. You need to be great every day, right? So I'm coaching that team, and at 19 years old, I get a phone call from the head coach at Riverdale, who I did not know. He said, look, I've heard about you. I've heard you're this young little whippersnapper that can flat-out coach. Would you come down to Riverdale and be one of my assistant coaches? Now, for the coaches in the room, this was the first year that that you could have an assistant on your team that did not teach. That would go on to be called the non-faculty coach. Everybody with me? This was the very first year in 96 that that was available. So he's on the phone with me, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking. So I ask him what any good 19-year-old would ask that was dumb, which was what? I'm like, well, sir, I just got one question for you. Uh, how much are you going to pay me to come down to Riverdale? And then I'm actually embarrassed to say this. Uh, I actually said, after all, I'm already making $199.50. I'm like, you may not even be able to afford me. And he laughed, and here's what he said. We're going to pay you $2,000. I'm like, $2,000? Man, I'm going to be there tonight, right? And I took this job at Riverdale at 19 years old. Now, why is this important? Here's what I don't want to happen to you. You goof off from 15 to 18. 
You, you go to college or don't go to college from 18 to 22. You try to figure out life until you're 25 or 30. Then you get serious about life. Here's, my, here's what I learned by going on this journey. I got serious about life at 15. I was already coaching at 18, which set me up to be the head coach at 22, which set me up to write my first book at 25, which set me up to build a multi-million dollar company by 35. Everybody understand where I'm going with this? I started early in life. I have a six-year-old daughter right now. Let me tell you something. In my house, we read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People before we go to bed. That's a joke, guys. We don't read all that. <laughs> but, but here's my point. I want my daughter to start early. But I will tell you this. My daughter and I sit down every night and we map out our next day. I brought a planner. Every day that I come into the day is already mapped out. This is my, this is my schedule. I sit down every night for 7 to 15 minutes and I map out my next day. Every hour is accounted for. My goals and targets are accounted for. What I'm doing every day. Do you know how many adults do this every day? Less than 2% of adults do this. I used to spend three and a half hours planning practice when I was at Riverdale. Just planning practice. You know why? Because every second mattered. I would never go into a day and just repeat what I did yesterday. Never. Every second mattered on that practice schedule. So I would spend hours thinking, writing up, rewriting it, writing it again, cutting things out until it was like, until it was a science. Because if I got an hour and a half with those kids, I'm going to maximize every single second because there's non-refundable seconds I can't get back. So, so every night, me and my six-year-old daughter, she has her notebook and I have my notebook. And she gets her notebook and we sit down together and I say, baby, get your notebook because we're going to map out our goals for tomorrow. And I say, what are your goals for tomorrow? You know what she says? She's six years old. She's like, be a good girl. That's, is that a goal? Yes or no? Be obedient. Good. I like this, right? Here, here's what she said. Uh, uh, be a helper at school. Have a good attitude. You know, they give away dojo points at my daughter's school when they do good. You know, get these little dojo points. She's like, get a couple dojo points. And then she says this. Be able to watch Strawberry Shortcake when I get home. <laughs> now, here's the deal. Are those goals for a six-year-old, yes or no? What do you think I'm training my daughter at six to do? Because you know what? Here's what I tell you. Most adults do not map out their days. And you know what? I run circles around those people. Because I'm ready and they're not. When I come into the day, it's on go. It, we ain't wasting any time. We got goals to hit. We got people to help. We ain't got time for drama. We ain't got time for uh, wasted time. We ain't got time for goofing off. We ain't got time for nothing but where we're going. You understand where I'm going with this? So, so at 19 years old, I go to Riverdale. Now I'm down there, and here's what I'm learning. Learn it. All the head coaches in the room learn this. Behind every great number one is a great number two. So I made up my mind that I was going to be the best assistant coach in America. I was going to get the head coach water. I was going to drive the bus. I was going to coach the team. I was going to do whatever he needed because in my mind, I'm like, if I do really good here, I'm going to get a head coaching job, right? So 19, 20, 21, I'm an assistant, and I'm learning under a master. Now, the person I worked for was not a great X and O coach, but let me tell you what he was great at. He was great with people. People loved him. People had a hard time getting mad at him. So I sit back and I watch, and I'm like, man, this dude is really good at connecting to people. He's really good at handling adversity. He's really good at keeping his composure. These are all things I struggled with. Like I would get too emotional and too passionate. And so I'm watching this guy, and I'm like, I'm learning. I'm taking notes. I watch how he does this. I watch how he does this. I watch how he does this. Because this is my period of mastery. Everybody understand what I'm saying? I'm studying under a master. I'm watching how he, how he does it. I'm studying coaches like Phil Jackson and at those days Rick Pitino and I'm studying their philosophies and Don Meyer was a huge impact on me. And so I go down to a Don Meyer clinic because Don Meyer used to do these big coaching clinics. Anybody been to those? Don Meyer was a great coach at David Lipscomb and he would do these coaching clinics where six or seven hundred people, coaches would go and, and so 19 years old, here's what I hear Don Meyer say. If you don't read another book this year, read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I'm like, I got to go get this book. I go get that book and I read those seven habits. And here's what I said. I'm going to make sure I teach all of my players these seven habits. So when you came into Riverdale at 14 years old, you learned the seven habits of highly effective people. Because I said, these habits are going to go with you the rest of your life. And I did success academies every day, leadership academies every day. Life after basketball every day. I was doing all of these things. This was back in 99, guys. This was almost unheard of. 
What was I doing? Coaching the whole person, the body, the mind, the heart, the spirit. I was coaching the body, that's skill. I was coaching the mind, that's knowledge. I was coaching the heart, that's passion. I was coaching the spirit, that's confidence. I was coaching all parts of a player's nature. And so what happened pretty quickly is my head coach retired and I became the youngest head coach in Tennessee at one of the, one of the biggest programs, but I had 30 years of losing. I had to turn this thing around. So I began talking about we're going to win a championship here. We're going to make girls basketball a dominant school in this state. And, and let me tell you something. Nobody supported me. I played a sub-state game in like my third or fourth year in McMahon. I had 43 people that went with me. My own principal didn't even go. No assistant principals went. In a sub-state game, and, and the last time the team was in a sub-state, it was years ago. Last time it was in a state championship, 1979. That's how little people thought of girls' basketball at Riverdale. This to tell you how bad it was, my first day of tryouts, I threw the ball over to a girl on the wing, and I said, kick it down low. She caught it, put it down on the floor, and kicked it over there. You don't kick a basketball. You kick a football and a soccer ball, but you don't kick a basketball. You see how far we had to go to build this thing? So let's go back. I'm winning. My very first year, we're 13 and 16. We win 13, we lose 16. Okay? My second year, we're 18 and 10. We won our first 16 games my second year, and then we lost almost 9 or 10 games in a row to end the season. We finished 18 and 10. My third year, we go 28 and 3. Now we're starting to build this machine. Now we're starting to build the players. We're teaching the seven habits. We're doing leadership academy. We're doing success things. And so now I'm about 25 years old and I come off a 28 and 3 season and, and people are starting to ask me, like, what are you doing with these kids? And so I said, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I'm going to write a book on it. And I wrote my first book that is now turned into 13 books. And I wrote my first book called Changing Lives Through Coaching. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think a good coach can change your life? Yes or no? How many of you had a good coach change your whole life? I want you to think about that. I'm telling you guys, who's coaching your kids is more important than who the President of the United States is. On average, I spent five and a half hours a day with my players for four years. How much impact could I have over you if I spent four, five and a half hours a day for four years with you? So I started writing books. When I started writing books, companies began to call me and say, what are you doing? We, got a, we picked up a copy of your book. Will you come over and speak to our company? Dale, State Farm, National Health Care. Now remember, I'm just a high school coach, guys. I'm just a high school coach. But because we're winning and building this machine, what do people want to know? What are you doing? I want you to think for the coaches in the room, I want you to build a program so strong people would pay money to come watch you. People would literally pay money to come watch you practice. They'd pay money to come watch you work out. They'd pay money to come look at your program. They'd pay money to see what you're doing. So, so I go over to Dell Computers and I speak at Dell Computers, which is a big company, and I'm, I'm going over there for 30 or 40 minutes. I'm going to speak, and I'm going to go back to Riverdale. And I get down there, and I coach for 30, 40 minutes, and the people at Dale's like, man, we really loved it. Will you come back? I was like, no, not interested. And I was like, well, sir, we, we really want you to come back and coach our people. I'm like, I'm not interested. I'm not trying to be rude, but I love coaching kids, and I have no intention of coaching adults. None. I'm going back to Riverdale. We're going to win a championship. That's my goal, right? And the guy said, okay, well, here, here's your check for speaking to our people. And I'm like, you going to pay me to speak to these folks? And I opened up that check, and it was more in an hour than I made in a whole month. And I was working 80 hours a week. What do you think I said then? I'm like, man, I'll be back every 15 minutes. You need me to come back tonight to the night crew? First time I started thinking about this, I started thinking that I had developed a skill set over those years that I could carry anywhere. You understand what I'm saying here? I could take it outside. Lou Holtz was speaking. Mike Krzyzewski was speaking. All the major football coaches were speaking. And I'm like, man, I can do this. So I'm coaching my team at Riverdale. We, we're winning. We're building a championship culture. And finally, after 10 years, now notice the word 10 years. Why is 10 years important? Anybody know why 10 years is important? There's a lot of studies that show that you have a major breakthrough at the 10-year mark. Because 10 years represents 10,000 hours of practice. And there's study after study after study that shows at 10 years of doing something, you have spent 10,000 hours doing it. And at that 10,000 hour mark, you have this huge breakthrough. Well, guess what happened in my 10th year at Riverdale? We won a championship. Guess what happened in my 10th year of running my coaching business? 
we reach multi-million dollar status. Huge breakthroughs. Why? Nothing more than just getting better and better and better and better and better and better until you are a master at what it is you do. You're no longer an apprentice. You've studied under a master. You've practiced what you see the master do. You are now becoming world class at what it is you do. And most people want success when? Right now. They want to turn a program around today. It took me 10 years to turn a program around at Riverdale. Now, I say that because Riverdale has now won seven of the last nine state championships. Y'all know that, right? And they have dominated girls' basketball. It didn't start this year. It didn't start last year. It didn't start the year before. It started X number 15, 20 years ago of getting in there every day and sowing seed and building it. So 31 years old, after I won a championship, I came back one more year and then I retired from Riverdale to start a coaching business. So now all I'll do is coach some of the top professionals in the world. Top sales professionals, top CEOs, top performers. And, and, uh, and I have a blast doing it. But I learned, I wouldn't be able to do any of the stuff I do today if I wouldn't have learned all of those things during the coaching cycle. Does that make sense? So coaches, let me say this, and I'm going to move to one other concept. There is more to winning than just coaching the body. Now, I want to be very clear about this. At 18 years old, when I studied under Stephen Covey, Covey wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he introduced a concept called the whole person theory. And he said that every person is made up of four parts, a body, a mind, a heart, and a spirit or conscience. Each of those parts produce different needs. The body's need is to live. The mind's need is to learn. The heart's need is to love and be loved. The spirit's need is to leave a legacy. And I'm looking at that model and I'm going, as coaches, we only coach one part of their nature, the body. We practice, we lift weights. If they don't perform, we, we push harder. We lift more weights. We have consequences. And here's the revelation I had. We're not coaching the whole kid. We got to start touching their heart and their spirit. And we got to start growing the whole person. And I begin to use this whole person theory. And you say, well, how do I use the whole person theory as a coach? The body, you got that part figured out. You know how to lift weights. You know how to condition. You know how to practice. The mind is engagement, learning. So when I was teaching these leadership academies and success academies and growing my players' minds, what do you think it was doing? It was engaging my players. And they're like, man, this is awesome. I'm learning. I'm growing. I'm getting better. What about the heart? What did I do for the heart? Appreciate the players. One-to-one -one attention with the players. I used to take a walk with my players after practice. I would pick one player a day, and we would go down to the football stadium, and I would take a couple laps with that one player. And let me tell you what I would say. How can I be a better coach for you? What's going on in your life and family? What's going on at school? How can I improve so I can coach you better? And you would be shocked at that one-to-one -one time how it changed our relationship. You see, the that's the heart. Okay, I was touching the heart, not just the body. I'm like, hey, practice is over. I'm not going to beat you up about practice. I'm not going to be on you anymore about practice. Let's just me and you talk. And I did it with every single player. Every day I took a walk with a different player. That was one of the single greatest things I ever did. Now, how do you touch a person's spirit? Spirit's tied to vision. I would bring in championship rings and let my players wear championship rings before we won them. I had, a, I had a gold basketball brought in and so my players could look at what it look, would look like to win a championship. I was creating things for them to see a bigger picture before we even got there. I was constantly living in the future. I was never living in the present. I was saying, we're going here. This is where we're going. Get on board. Be a part of this. Can you imagine? I brought in a videographer to, to, to film what it would be like standing in the middle of Murphy Center uh, with 10,000 people cheering on our players. I began to show our players what it meant to be a champion. Because guess what? They didn't know what it meant to be a champion. You know why? They never won a championship. They didn't know what a championship ring felt like. They didn't know what a gold ball looked like. They didn't know what it felt like to stand in front of 10,000 people. And I began visioneering all these things for my players. So visuals were everywhere. If you ever go to Riverdale, you'll see pictures, all of these things. I had the locker room completely redone. Listen, y'all got some nice digs here. I come over here tonight, I'm like, ain't no way I'm in Lebanon. Am I in Lebanon, Tennessee? This school is incredible. I would kill to have a school like this, facilities like this. I mean, it's amazing what you have access to here. I mean, it really is. 
So, so what I begin doing, coaches, parents, how good can you be? What good is it to have skill with no passion? Everybody get that? Skill is body, physical. What do we say about a person that has a lot of talent with no drive? What do we say? Yeah. Hey, here, wasted. Here's what I say, wasted talent, man. Wasted potential. Here's another word we use, lazy. Got all that talent in the world with no drive to use it. What good is that? It's no good. It's of no value whatsoever. What good is it to have a, 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 a bunch of skill, that's the body, with no confidence, that's the spirit. What good is it to have a bunch of confidence with no skill? <laughs> that's called arrogance, by the way. Everybody with me? And I had some players, I'm telling you, they were more confident but couldn't back it up. Confidence is the ability to back it up. So for the coaches in the room, I began learning. I, here, let me put it this way. My goal was to become a master of human potential. Everybody see that? I'm no longer a coach. Part of coaching is getting the most. Let's say I'm coaching you. My whole job is to extract every bit of your knowledge, skill, desire, and confidence out of you. And I'm going to give you all of my knowledge and all of my skill and all of my desire and all of my confidence. I'm going to coach the whole person. What good? Here's one for you. What good is it to, to have... What happens when you have a broken heart? How much effort do you put into something you don't care about? Don't matter how much talent you got. What about a broken spirit? See what I'm saying? So a lot of coaches don't understand the whole person theory. So when they lose, here's what they do. They just work the players harder. They condition them more. They don't get to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is you're, you don't have the passion you need to be successful. You don't have the drive. Our skills are not where they need to be. So here's what happens. And I was guilty of this my first two or three years at Riverdale. All I did was just work the players harder. You know I had five ACL tears in my first year? Five. I went to my team physician. I said, look, doc, what's the problem? You know what he said? You are the problem. He said, you have increased the intensity on these players so much from the previous coach that their bodies can't physically handle it. Now, I want you to think about that. See, my previous coach was operating like this, and I did this. Boom. My players couldn't handle it. So you know what we did? Hire a strength and conditioning coach. Come out with, we were one of the first people to lift uh, girls in 1999 lifting, lifting girls like guys was unheard of we had a full time strength and conditioning coach and we lifted the players year round and here's what I told my strength and conditioning coach I don't want them to get hurt I need you to strengthen their muscles I need you to strengthen their ligaments I need you to, I need you to get them ready so they don't get injured everybody see what I'm talking about here that was unheard of in 1999 have a strength and conditioning coach for girls basketball Okay, so, so I want to finish with this concept. So coaches, parents, if your, player has a, if your daughter has a broken heart, what she's going to do is she's going to disengage. I think the job of a great coach is not to beat the confidence out of a kid. The job of the great coach is to build, maintain, and protect the confidence of the athlete. Everybody understand what I'm saying? And I've done it both ways, guys. My first three years at Riverdale... I beat the confidence out of my players, which is why I didn't win any championships. 25 years old, I said, I'm going to change. I'm going to be a coach these kids love to play for. And when I made that shift, you can't imagine what happened. I wasn't looking at them saying they need to get better. I was looking at me and said, I need to get better. So along the way, and I'll finish with this story, and I appreciate you being here tonight. I know you had a long day. I had a long day too coaching adults, which is like coaching kids trying to get them motivated. Along the way, I wrote down on a napkin this statement. And this may be the best thing I tell you tonight. I wrote down on a napkin after practice one day, confidence is the one thing that affects everything. A player with confidence can do anything and at least will try to do anything. A player without confidence will not try, will not put theirself in a situation to fail. And I said, I have to become a master at building, maintaining, and protecting players' confidence. Okay? And so for the next couple of years, I studied confidence at the highest level. What is it? How do you lose it?
How do you get it back once you lost it? What erodes it? How do I, be, how do I make you so confident? And I used to tell my parents, when I'm done with your daughter, she's going to be, she could run for president of the United States. That's how confident your daughter's going to be when I'm done with her. Did they come to me that way? No. They came to me insecure. They came to me with issues. They came to me with problems. But through my cycle, I called it the greatness factory. I called it the greatness factory. I'm building, I'm building champions here. I'm building winners. And so I eventually wrote this book called Swag. Swag is a term for confidence. And I basically took science and I said, this is a book that every person on planet Earth needs to read. Because if there's one thing I want my daughter to have, she don't have to be the smartest kid in class. She don't have to be the valedictorian. She don't have to be most successful. When I'm done with her at high school or college, you know what I want her to be able to do? Walk into any room, talk to any person, connect with anybody, try any dream. That's what I need my daughter to be able to do. That's what school should do for her. That's what her coaches should do for her. And so in this book, here's what I said. What is confidence? Somebody give me a definition of confidence. Where can we get some? Can we go down to Walmart and buy some confidence? Because if we could sell it, we would sell a bunch of it, wouldn't we? Right? 20 years old. So I asked myself, where did my confidence come from? came from my mother who instilled in me, son, you get up every day. My mom wouldn't let me miss a day of school uh, when I was growing up. When I woke up, didn't feel like going, she was just said, get dressed. We, we, we show up, we grow up, and we deliver. I hated it. I'm like, so-and-so got to miss school the other day. She said, I don't care. She said, I'm going to teach you the habit of showing up when you don't feel like it. And I called my mom one day at 30-something years old, and, and, and I said, look, you're a big part of the reason I'm successful because I show up every day whether I feel like it or not. There's days today I don't feel like it. And I'm in the motivation business. But everybody wakes up some days and don't feel like it. But you know what the difference between an amateur and a professional is? Am amateurs don't show up. What do professionals do? They show up whether they feel like it or not. So what is confidence? Give me a definition of confidence. Any definition. Confidence is the memory of success. Is that a good one? What if you hadn't had success? So my girl basketball players, I had a basketball player that shot 92% from the free throw line her senior year. Any of y'all shoot 92% from the free throw line? You know why she shot 92%? She came in every Sunday and she practiced for four hours by herself at game speed. And I was so enamored with her work ethic. I would work in my office on Sunday afternoons and I would go up to the upstairs gym and watch her practice. And I was like, man, that's crazy. She'd bring a radio in and I'd just watch her go as hard as she could and she'd get tired and shoot free throws, get, work hard, shoot free throws. So, so it's almost unheard of to shoot 92% from the free throw line. But you know why she shot 92%? Because she came in on Sunday when nobody else did. Confidence is the memory of success. And you build success like a muscle. The more you work it, the better you get, the more confident you become. That's why it's called muscle memory, by the way. Everybody with me? What else is confidence? Internal knowing that you can create something. So if I said Lebanon girls basketball or football or baseball is going to win a championship, the very first thing some people are going to say is, no, oh, it ain't going to happen in Lebanon because you can't beat so-and-so, so-and-so, we can't beat so-and-so. That's insecurity. It don't happen until somebody believes you can do it. Like I believed we could do it when nobody else believed we could do it. That's confidence. I just didn't know how long it was going to take. So what tears down confidence? Opinion of other people. Lack of preparation. Right? Not, you know, these things erode your confidence. You know you're not prepared. You ever show up for a test you didn't study for? How confident are you? You ain't confident at all. You know why? No preparation. Confidence is founded by preparation and preparation and preparation. When Corey said that I spoke in front of 10,000 people, I was nervous, man. I was nervous. They kept bumping my speaking time back. I think I, I, think I used the bathroom 27 times. I was so nervous because I was nervous because I hadn't been in front of 10,000 people, but I was confident. Just give me the stage. Just put me in front of those people. I know I can do it. You know why? Because I spent a whole lifetime doing it. All I needed was opportunity to do it. Everybody with me? So, so how do you get your confidence back when you lose it? How many of you have lost your confidence before? Now, now I'm going to tell you something, coaches. My senior year of high school, I had six turnovers in a district championship game or first round of the district tournament. I was a point guard. I had six turnovers in the first half. 
And I come over to the sideline, I'll never forget this. My coach just kept yelling at me. What's wrong with you? You're going to cost us the ball game. You ain't going to do this. Why can't you turn it over? Why can't you do that? Listen, that didn't help. I knew I had six turnovers. Everybody understand what I'm saying? This is a big lesson. What did I, look, now don't miss this. What I needed him to say was, you're my point guard. I believe in you. You can do this. Suck it up. Let's keep going. Forget about the first half. The harder, it's not that I couldn't take the coaching. I was so mental at that point. I was nervous. I was scared. And the more he got on me, the worse I got. You understand what I'm saying? What I needed him to do is go, you my man. You got us to this point and you're going to get us to the next point. I believe in you. See, coaches get, all, get too emotional. Players get emotional. The players need you to stay calm because they're emotional. You're getting paid to stay calm, not lose your composure. And I know because I, I lost it a lot until one day one of my assistant coaches said this. She's like, you got to calm down, man. She's like, you're, the players are coming over to you for timeout and you are all over the place. You're emotional, you're screaming, you're yelling, right? She's like, chill out. And I hated hearing that from her. I'm like, who are you to tell me? I'm the head coach, you're assistant coach. But you know what? I went back to her a couple days later and I said, it's the best advice you could ever give me because you're right, I do get too emotional and I need to stay calm because I was eroding confidence. Confidence is the one thing that affects everything. Okay, so let me close this out with this. I wrote a book called Small Towns and Big Dreams because Lebanon is a small town, right? I wrote this book because I got so sick of people saying that you couldn't do anything big from a small town. And I grew up in Woodbury, Tennessee. And I heard it over. Corey grew up there. Do you know how many championship coaches have come out of Woodbury, Tennessee? Randy King, Rick Insell, Corey Barrett, Brandon Burks. There's like 10 to 15 coaches. We, we grew coaches in our little town, successful coaches. But I, I heard so many people say you'll never do anything big because you're from that little bitty podunk town. And I'm like, I'm going to show you. And I went back and researched all the people who grew up in small towns. Presidents, famous people, you know, people that did big things in the world. And I'm like, man, I, I, if they can do it, I can do it, Right? So you're sitting here tonight and you're listening to this message and thank you for coming. I'd love to have a full auditory, but, but listen, the people showed up got coached. The question is, what are you going to go do with what you learned tonight? Are you going to take this and do anything with it? Or are you going to go back doing the same thing you've been doing? When I wrote The Anatomy of Winning with Rick Insell, here's what's interesting. I thought every coach in America would buy it. I said, if you haven't won a championship and you'd like to win a championship, here's how I did it. We couldn't give that book away. We couldn't give it away. You know why? Coaches are prideful, man. It's hard to tell them anything, right? And I'm like, if you haven't won a championship and you want to win one, then what you need to be doing is studying other people that have won them. Not from an arrogant perspective. Like, like, like that's what I did to win one. I went to other people. And if you ever hear Ensel talk, he likes to joke and he says this, between me and you, Coach Burt, we won 11 championships. I won one and he won 10. Still true, Right? So I want to end you with this. We got this new Kids Academy. I am uh, adamant that, that kids are not learning the things they need to learn to be successful in the real world. Let me give an example. Bounce back. How to handle rejection. How to be emotionally tough. How to have confidence. How to learn how to lead a group. Okay, and so what I've basically done is I put all of these trainings into this kids academy that we are now basically partnering with schools. So my daughter's school, Middle Tennessee Christian, every sixth grader to ninth grader is on my online academy because I went to, to take her to school and I said this, where is my daughter? Uh, I asked the principal, who I know Robert Say, another guy from Woodbury, Tennessee. I asked the principal, I said, uh, love your presentation, love the school, love the spirit, Love, love everything you got going on at Middle Tennessee Christian. I just got a couple questions for you. Where is my daughter going to learn how to get back up when she gets knocked down? What course is that in? Well, we don't really have a course in that. Well, where is she going to learn confidence? Where is she going to learn how to handle perceived rejection? Where is she going to learn how to communicate at a high level? Where is she going to learn how to go out there and crush her dreams? 
that, well, we don't have any courses on that. And I said, well, isn't that the number one thing we need our daughter to know? Yes or no? So if you don't have any courses on this, I'd like to supply those courses for you. So about a year ago, I sat down and I created this online academy for kids. And I want you to look at the courses that we have in there. Okay? So, it's got a, so, so if you look at, uh, click on Unlock the Potential. Unlock your full potential. Here's what a lot of parents say to their kids. Here's what a lot of parents say to their kids. Uh, you got a lot of what? We tell kids they got a lot of, how many times have you heard you got a lot of potential? Here's what I said. Have you ever sat down and explained what potential is? Like don't just tell kids they got potential. You need to say this is how you activate that potential. Potential is kinetic energy. So basically what this is, is you click on it, how to build, maintain, and protect your confidence. Click on start on that. So guess what? Old Coach Burt pops up, boom. How to build, starts coaching maintain, you. and protect your confidence. I want to break confidence down. Confidence is the memory of success. All right, stop it right there. Confidence is an Here's what I want to show knowing you on that you can create or So manifest, when you're thinking about this concept, make reality, I would ask the parents in the room, in where are your kids going to get these things at? Confidence is the ability to take okay, an idea it, and Chelsea. see it through to its logical... Where, 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 where are your... Where, what class do you have on confidence, by the way? Anybody have a class on that? Baseball coach, wouldn't it be nice if every kid had a class on confidence? Because I remember getting up there to hit. My confidence is shot. Had three balls bounce off my face. And I'm like, man, I need some confidence. Where do I get it from? So one thing affects everything, man. I'm telling you, the stuff we're talking about in this, in this online academy is stuff that every player here. Now, Coach Barrett called me one day. And he said, I want to do a lot of that stuff you did when you were at Riverdale. How do I do it? And I wrote a book. I said, I sat down on a Saturday afternoon and I wrote a book. And I said, it's called The Intangibles. Because there's more to winning than practice. And I said, I'm going to put everything I did in this book. All you got to do is buy the book. Well, now the version is what? Everything I did at Riverdale to build kids is in this online academy. If that makes sense. It's just me coaching them every day. So Coach Barrett's going to get his team on it. They're going to watch some segments every single week. And I, you're not going to sit there for hours. You can watch it on a phone. You can watch it on an iPad. You can watch it on anything. I sit down with my daughter at night. We pull it up on the phone. And we go through a lesson. Like we may go through confidence. Remember, she's six years old. And I go through confidence and I say, what did that mean to you, sweetheart? What is confidence? Well, confidence is this, daddy. Confidence is this. What does resilience mean to you? Well, I think, right? And I may break it down. What is leadership to you? And she's like, you like, like being a fine leader? I'm like, yes, that's leadership. But every night we sit down and we try to go through a few lessons of this because I want to equip my daughter to be successful later in life. What if she don't have good coaches? My opinion, the coach is a key part of this equation, growing the body, the mind, the heart, and the spirit of a person. We can't put it on the school system because school teachers have biology to teach and, and algebra to teach and everything to teach, and they're getting measured by testing. But, but the emotional intelligence part is one thing you're never going to be tested on. This is emotional intelligence, which in, when every study in the world says this is the number one intelligence. Not the mind, emotional intelligence. Bounce back this. So if you're here tonight and you want to talk about the Kids Academy or what we're doing, if you're a coach, talk about, talk about all those things. We'll be happy to talk to you about it. I'm not here to sell it to you. I think this is going to be big. And more than anything, I, I got sick of people talking about what we need to be doing for kids, but nobody do it. Would you agree? Well, we need to be doing this for kids. Well, we need to be teaching this. I'm like, man, I'm sick, of, I'm sick of people talking about this. We're going to sit down and do something about this. You know where I'm going next with this, guys? A school. A physical school called the Greatness Factory. Guess what we're going to be teaching there during the day? Confidence, bounce back, leadership, how to get success academies. And, and I'm going to build an independent school. And my daughter will be able to go to that school. Okay, because, but, because that's where I think the future is going. I think we got to be ahead of this versus behind it. So that's my way to give back, okay? I've really enjoyed this tonight. Have you enjoyed it? Yes, sir. I'm low on confidence. Y'all got to give me some feedback here, right? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? Any question that you want to ask at all, guys? Any question at all? Number one, you came tonight, so what does that tell me about you? You're interested in your potential, aren't you? You need to be interested in everything. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes. That's right. Good question. Great question. And I, and I do, and I, we all struggle with confidence. 
Let me tell you this. I believe when you're low on confidence, you can borrow from somebody else. When you're low on confidence, you can borrow confidence. So I have X number of people that I listen to. Every morning, I start my day off with uh, certain things that I listen to and read. Every night before I go to bed, I listen to certain things and I read. When I get in a funk or when I lose my confidence or when I, when I feel like it's not working, then I've got certain people I go to to, to feed that. You know what? Because confidence is real hungry. It has to be fed every single day. Podcast, videos. You know the average American reads less than one book a year? How can you get better if you're not reading, if you're not studying, if you're not growing, if you're not watching podcasts, if you're not listening? Okay? And, and, and here's the deal. It's so much content out there for you to get better in. There's no excuse for not. Find something you're interested in. And, and study it and watch it. For all the coaches, study the great coaches. What are they doing? How are they doing it? What are they, how are they teaching the kids? How are they, what, are, what are they doing to, to connect with players? I did a retreat a few weeks ago with Hugh Freeze. Hugh Freeze, the former head coach at Ole Miss, who is, who is right now one of the hottest coaching commodities in America. He's got job offers from the University of Tennessee, Florida State. He's got an offer, offer to be the head coach at Liberty University, head football coach. Everybody in America wants him to be their offensive coordinator. And you know why? Because he scored 45 points on Saban back-to-back -back years. Only coach to beat Nick Saban. And I'm telling you, he is an offensive genius. And I did this retreat where he and I were coaching people for three or four days. So we go down to Florida, and we spend two or three days. And here's what I wanted. I, call, I called him out of the blue. I said, Coach Freeze, it's Coach Burke. He said, oh, yeah, Coach, I remember you from Riverdale because he used to coach at White Station. I said, man, you got a great story. Lost his job at Ole Miss, making $4 million a year. Walked in and fired him with no severance, no anything. The one thing they said he didn't have is they said he didn't have control. He didn't have enough control over the boosters. And he, 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 listen, here's what he said. There ain't no way to control all those people. You can't try to control them. Even when you think you got them under control, you can't control them. And I believed him. I, I believed 100% of what he told me. And we spent three days coaching with each other. And let me tell you what I took away from that. He was the real deal, man. When I say the real deal... Like, like, like it ain't a show, he's the real deal. You understand where I'm going with this? That's why he's in such demand, because he's that good. You don't get to those levels without being good. So, so, so but, but during that period, you know what he did? He lost every bit of his confidence. He goes from being a head coach at Ole Miss, filling out the stadium, to, to, to literally going places in Oxford, Mississippi, where people wouldn't talk to him, look at him, say hi to him. People bowed out on him. Some of his friends wouldn't be there for him during that period. He, he told me he lost every bit of his confidence. Slowly but surely, he had to get it back. It didn't hurt that Nick Saban called him and offered him a job. But that, they wouldn't let him hire him. Saban offered him a job as offensive coordinator, and, and the officials in the SEC would not let him hire him. Imagine taking away your passion. Coaches in the room, imagine if I came to you tomorrow and said you can't coach. And that's the one thing you love more than anything. That's what happened to him. But he come back, man. He bounced back. So that's my answer on confidence. Even people at the highest level making millions of dollars lose their confidence. It's not a bad, it's, it's going to happen to you. Does that make sense? How fast can you get it back? Great question. Any other questions? Jimmy McDowell? Jimmy and I go way back, way back to Riverdale days. All right, good. Listen, guys, thank, I want to thank you for coming tonight. You didn't have to do this. But I appreciate you showing up. That's the first step to winning, man. Show up every day. Every single day, you show up every single day. People ask me, do you still work 80 hours a week? I used to work 80 hours a day on, uh, eight hours a day on Sunday. I'd get up and go to church, and then I'd go to my office and watch eight hours of film, mop the floors, clean. And uh, I tell people, I still work 80 hours. I just work with the people I want to work with every day. And, and, and now I have... I hate to use the word balance, but now I have more balance because I can pick and choose what I do and when I do it. But I still put the same amount of passion and energy into what I do today that I did then. I'm still coaching people. I'm just coaching on a different level and different people. Okay? So God bless you guys. Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you. <laughs>